Hi, everybody. Okay. So how's everyone doing? I guess I'm the guy who stands between you and alcohols. That's a, that's a tough position to be in in D.C. So I just came in from Wyoming. Uh, we had a big event. The total registration was about 100,000 people. Uh, we had about uh, eight, 900 in Wyoming, and uh, we were all around the world. Miami, London, Cape Town, Tokyo, Berlin. Uh, Mahela put out some stuff here in D.C. And it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. We got to meet a lot of very interesting people. So uh, there's IO Global, my company, and there's the types of products we work on, like Atala Prism, Cardano, and so forth. What we are at our core is a systems company. And our goal, our vision, is to improve the systems of the world for everyone everywhere. So what the heck does that mean? What's the purpose of that? Well, when you look at things like governments, there are collections of systems working together, hopefully for the greater good of the trustees, for the people, the beneficiaries. And governments do things. They regulate marketplaces. They hold elections to endow consent into specialized actors. So they have the ability to arrest people or protect people or run the fire service. They do collective investments that are for the social good. For example, they go ahead and build uh, you know, rockets to take us to the moon. Uh, they fight wars when where it's necessary. Now, most of human society has been constructed to stave off war, famine, and disease. That's why we build governments. That's why we build societies. And thus, our institutions, our philosophies, our religions, these types of things are in some way constructed around those concepts. What's happened is that technology has started moving very quickly. If you take a look at an ax that was made during the Bronze Age, and you compare it to an ax that was made in Germany during the Middle Ages, doesn't look too different. It's quite familiar. If you take a look at when the Wright brothers first took to the sky to when we landed on the moon, it's about 60 some years. And that's only accelerating because of the internet, because of globalization, mass distribution of education. There is a rapid progression of the capabilities of mankind as a whole. And thus the institutions that we have inherited don't work as well as they should. As a consequence, faith in those institutions is decaying. So, and you could see it in everyday places. You poll people and you say, do you think your vote counts? Depending on the political spectrum, some people say yes, some people say no. You look at people and say, do you trust science? Some people say yes, some people say no. What they're really saying is we don't trust the institutions behind these types of things. We think that there's doublespeak, bias, agendas, these types of things. There's a lack of honesty and credibility. This is the birth of our industry, the cryptocurrency space, the blockchain space. Where did Bitcoin come from? Embedded in the very first block in Bitcoin was a reference to the bailout and the financial crisis. It wasn't the amazing job that the institutions of the global regulatory and financial community was doing that created Bitcoin. It was the lack thereof of that job. It was the collapse of these things, the crises, the we had to abandon our principles to save our principles. It's so easy when you're in a position of power to find an exception to the rule. We were told last year we could print trillions of dollars, and somehow this is not going to have any impact on inflation. Then we get told, well, as long as you discount the price of beef, chicken, and pork, and wood, inflation is not so bad. You see, this is the reality we live in. And people, they internalize it, they understand it, and they're looking for alternatives. They're looking for a return to trust in institutions in some way or shape or form. Now, that is not a political issue. It's a human issue at its very core. We have human rights. We want to be treated with fairness, dignity, honesty, reciprocity. We want to know that the people that we do business with are reputable. We want to know that when we express ourselves, we're heard. We want to know that when we enter into a commercial relationship, that that commercial relationship has rule of law. The great nations of the 20th century were not the nations defined by their military power. That was an after effect of the greatness. They were the ones defined by the innovators, 
the rule of law, the businesses, the innovations they brought, the creativity that they had. And it just so happened they built militaries to protect those things because they valued them. There's never been a time in human history where that was the case, but that was the century we just came from. So as we look to the future, the point of our industry, the blockchain industry and the cryptocurrency industry, is to have a frank conversation of how are we going to live in a world, regulate a world, control a world, where we don't want empires anymore. We don't want the American system or the Chinese system or the European system. We'd like to live in one global community where we have basic principles, no matter where you happen to be born, are universal. Our company does an enormous amount of work in Africa. I've been to 52 countries over the last few years. We have an office in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. Next month I'm going all throughout Africa, South Africa, Burundi, Malawi, Zanzibar, Ethiopia, Kenya, Egypt. That's quite the tour in three weeks. Right now, I think we have about five heads of state. And every single one of them tell me the same things again and again and again. How do we compete? How do we attract direct foreign investment? How do we make people believe that we've made progress and our countries are the countries to invest in, build in, create jobs in? They all say the same thing. The faces change, the flags change, the ministries change, the pitch changes. You get to see some cool stuff. Egypt, you get to see the pyramids. How about that? It's fun. But they're saying the same things, just in different languages and different ways. And I always have the same answer. How strong are your institutions? How much do people believe in those institutions? Why do they believe in those institutions? Where does the trust and credibility come from for those things? And the point of the blockchain space is it's the first time we've built a social system that goes from don't be evil to can't be evil. The rules can't change. And it seems so simple, but yet it's so powerful because when you think about the scientific revolution, the rules don't change because you want them to. There's been more than one mountaineer that suddenly wished that gravity didn't apply to him. And there's certainly plenty of people who build things for a living who wish they could change the laws of physics just a little bit for a competitive advantage, but you can't. They are what they are, and no matter who you are, what language you speak, where you come from, you're treated equally. So when you build systems with those types of bedrocks, they have absolute certainty and belief. People connect to them, people understand them, and there's also reproducibility. It doesn't matter where you come from, what you've been told, what you've been said, you can verify the things that you are seeing are true. One of the greatest principles and properties of Bitcoin, for example, is this idea of inclusive accountability. When someone sends you a transaction containing some Bitcoin in it, you don't trust them. You don't trust a bank. You don't trust a financial institution. You don't trust a regulator. You don't trust anyone. You have a, enough information, a copy of the system to be able to validate the thing that you're seeing is right. Can you imagine how good life would be if that was the case in all your dealings? Someone walks up to you and says, I'm a lawyer. And you can instantly look at them and know that they're actually on the bar and they're a real lawyer. Somebody walks up to you, I'm a doctor, same thing. If someone says, okay, well, you know, this is what happened on Tuesday, you get video evidence of it right there. That would be great. The world usually doesn't work that way. And when we look at our institutions, they normally don't work that way either. Look at our military spending, for example. It's just a great case study. Where the hell does all that money go? And every time someone asks, they tend to forget about it. Oh, yeah, we lost those records, so sorry. Pick your favorite government agency. Talk about TRICARE and the VA, holy hell. There's so many places where trillions of dollars are spent, many promises are made, and every time you're told it, you see it, you cannot personally verify it. The real power of Bitcoin is it opened the world up to the prospect and the idea that you have some social system where you can check yourself. And that gave us all the freedom to dream in a certain respect. It gave us the freedom to start asking what other systems can we build where we have the inclusive accountability property? Could perhaps we build a voting system? When a vote happens, you can check and make sure it was recorded. That sounds interesting. 
Perhaps we can build a supply chain system when someone says this is organic or fair trade or environmentally sustainable or carbon neutral. Big topic. You can actually check that right on the label, right there, and you don't trust the vendor, the merchant. You don't trust King Supers. You don't trust Kroger. You have a system that's built on principles and bedrock that can't change. Not can't, not, don't be evil, can't be evil at its core. That's really what this is all about. Now, why is it scary? Well, it's scary for three reasons. One, when you change institutions, it doesn't happen very often. And sometimes you get real lucky, and you get rid of kings and queens and emperors, and you get democracies and republics. And sometimes you get really unlucky, and you get the Soviet Union. I saw something earlier uh, from uh, professor's presentation when he's talking about the metaverse, and he said, oh, people will escape into the metaverse because they want to escape regulation. And I couldn't help but remember a friend of mine who's a mathematician, his name is Sergei, he went to Mo uh, Moscow State. And I asked him, why did you go into mathematics? And he said, that was the only way I could find freedom in the Soviet Union. Because none of the bureaucrats could understand math, so anytime I expressed myself in it, they wouldn't mind. There was no commissars. <laughs> Think about that, just for a moment. It's scary. When you change institutions, Everything is up for grabs. What is freedom of speech? How much privacy should we have? Who gets to decide these things? What is good money? We had a great lecture about the nature of money. Well, okay, there's the textbook definition, the store value, the means of account, these types of things, okay? Means of exchange unit of account. Well, what makes good money? I'd argue credit is deeply and interconnected to that. The ability to forecast the value of the money three, five, 10, 15, 20 years into the future. Can you live in an economy with multiple currencies? Some for storing and some for means of exchange, some for unit of account. Can you break these things apart? Should you follow an inflationary or a deflationary monetary policy? Should your money be based on things that are immutable? Why do the Austrians love the gold standard? Because you can't lie in that standard. You can't print gold. It's just that simple. Do you need to create these types of restraints in your system or not? Depends on your faith in the institutions. Depends on the nature of the institutions, the winners and losers you want to have. What if we want to create a dual currency system where we have today money and future money? So as a thought experiment, and this is something our industry is going to enable and why it's so powerful and so scary. What if to buy a house, to buy property, to start a business, to go to school, you don't just pay for it in dollars. You pay for it in today dollars and $2,200. Dollars. dollars you earn for doing something good for somebody who lives two centuries from now. Okay, suddenly now you have both a long-term and short-term horizon in the way you think and optimize. You don't want the world to be a disaster and the environment burnt out and all the species to go extinct, so you have to do stuff to prevent that in the year 2200. And that's the only way you can earn that money, right? Well, suddenly capitalism kicks in, and we have all these businesses that are actually building a future for people that we'll never meet and never see, we'll be long dead. But they're doing it because they're making a fortune. Meanwhile, they actually make the world a better place. Go figure for our great, great, great grandchildren. How do you do something like that? Well, you do that by issuing a currency that represents that, put some sort of logic behind it, and then suddenly incentives kick in, consumer behavior kicks in, and lo and behold, global warming is no longer a concern. Lo and behold, everybody's an environmentalist, especially ExxonMobil. Why? Because they make more money being an environmentalist than they do taking oil out of the ground. You see, the, one of the great lessons we've learned over the last century is if you incentivize it, they will do it. And one of the superpowers of the cryptocurrency space and its ability to transform institutions is the ability to align incentives for anything we want. And that's why people are so terrified. If you structure these things in the right way, you can get rid of CEOs and presidents and kings, centralization. Uber could go away, Airbnb can go away, all these tech monopolies, Google, Facebook, Apple, many of them are middlemen of necessity. You can actually replace them, in many cases, with protocols and software. So if you're at the top of the old society, wouldn't you be a little scared if new technology is coming that's going to change everything? But the lesson we've learned as the drum of technology beats is that it actually ought not to be terrifying. 
Because even if there are winners and losers as you restructure things, collectively humanity wins, always. Any time you embrace something that makes society more resilient, sustainable, equal, fair, and give people a better access to opportunity in the future, overall, life gets better for everybody, including the kings and the queens. Don't believe me? Would you like to trade for Rockefeller and live in the time he lived in with all of his money? The minute that you get an ulcer in your stomach, you could die? No antibiotics? That type of society? No airplanes around? You'd rather be middle class today. You have the internet. You have all this magic. You have all this lifestyle. You could be a king. Mansa Musa, richest man in Africa. So powerful that everywhere you go, he create inflation because he gave away so much gold. Most powerful man on the continent for his time. He would trade for any one of you for your lifestyle, for the power that you all have at your fingertips. And where did it come from? It came from a free society creating it. So we can never allow our fear of the unknown and technology corrupt the fact that if we embrace it the right way, it can take us to a much better future that solves a lot of problems. The 21st century is the most terrifying in human history because we have so many existential problems before us. When I was growing up, my dad was growing up, my grandfather was growing up, the only existential technology we had to worry about were nuclear weapons. That was the only one that could end all of us. The world took it seriously. That's why you had SALT and the Department of Energy and all these watchdog groups trying to constrain that. Now, the 21st century, you have nanotechnology, artificial general intelligence. You have CRISPR creating gain-of-function research. Dozens and dozens and dozens of existential technologies, which are not just the provenance of nation states. These are the things that small groups of people, 10, 20, 30, well-motivated, well-intended perhaps, maybe not, could accidentally screw something up. It cascades and kills billions of people or devastates society. And somehow the institutions of yesterday are supposed to correct that. They simply can't. So the core of our industry, the blockchain industry, is about asking, how do you handle society? where information, value, thought, travels instantaneously. How do you handle society where people no longer buy the fictions and believe the narratives that they're told? There's no longer faith in the old way of doing things. They demand inclusive accountability. They can instantly fact check anything you say. How do you build a society when deep fakes are coming and any one of us in 10 or 20 years can say anything and appear to be anybody? It's a hard question. So that's why we build what we build at my company. This is why we think what we think. This is the point of the industry at its core. I'm so tired of coming to conversations and, well, is it a security or not a security? Well, it's never a bloody fucking security. <laughs> and don't tell me IPO registration is an easy thing. If you believe so, tell me which startup has done it successfully. None cost hundreds of millions of dollars, and it's done for pre-existing businesses with a decade of a track record or more in the United States. It's completely absurd to say that's a valid financing method. Furthermore, once the founders disappear and the company disappears, how is it still a security? Who files for it? Who registers for it? It's a completely new economy. We found the financial stem cell. Cryptocurrencies can be anything. You can wake up and they can be currencies. They can be commodities. They can be multi-incentive systems. They can be securities if you want them to be. They can be debt instruments if you want them to be. They're everything. You regulate them based on how they're used by the actors there and then at the moment of the transaction. It's just that simple. <laughs> and, you know, I'd rather talk about more abstract things and get people interested in the fact that for the first time ever in your adult lives, you're actually in control of the restructuring of human society. People in our industry, for better or for worse, are making decisions today, probably unbeknownst to them, that will impact the way we live in the next few decades and throughout most of the 21st century and how governments get along. Last year, I had a conference, and I invited Vint Cerf to come. Anybody know who Vint is? Few, few people. He created the internet with Bob Kahn. 
worked at DARPA at the time. And he had absolutely no idea the gravity or magnitude of the research he was doing at Stanford with Bob. He was just sitting there and the, the design brief was, let's create some sort of decentralized network to connect some stuff together in case, you know, nuclear weapons come off or something. Oh, sounds like a fun project. Let's go do that. And he just made arbitrary decisions. Oh, this is how big the address space should be. Oh, we don't need authentication. You know, if there's a problem, we can just pick up the phone book and call the guy on the other side. It's small network. Four billion computers, mobile computers. You're out of your damn mind. There's like 20 of them. They're the size of a room. And so those decisions he made in the creation of TCP IP completely influence how your computer works, how your cell phone works, how we connect to the internet, the winners and losers of the entire ISP war. How AT&T, Cisco, all these other companies do business, completely made by the decisions of two people and some graduate students at Stanford. And we all inherit that, for better or for worse. So exactly the same situation is happening right now. The smart contract standards, the consensus standards. Are we going to have systems that give us truth by burning out the planet and using enormous amounts of electricity? Are we going to use other systems? There's philosophical reasons for both. We'll debate and discuss them. Somebody's going to win, and whoever wins, that's the way it is. And the next generation just has to deal with it, and they'll be told that's the way it is. These things are immutable after they set for at least decades to centuries. So it's important for everybody to take a step back and say, why are we here? Why are people scared? Why do we see the rhetoric? Why do we feel the way we do? And do understand that these young people, some old, working together, are basically deciding how the entire human race is going to get along or not get along. And there are very high stakes. Look at China, for example. Very harsh at times with it. I think social credit is one of the greatest evils mankind has ever come up with. I have no tolerance for a society where you're told that your entire value as a human being is compressed down to a number decided by a machine. It's just wrong. It's always going to be wrong. It's always been wrong. And if that's indoctrinated and institutionalized and linked in every single system, from the money system to the transportation system to your passport to your education system, and it's the sole decider of whether you get a job. It's the sole decider of whether people are allowed to associate with you. And it's going to get so pervasive that when augmented reality comes, people can see your credit score on your face when they look at you through their glasses, and they're told if they associate with people with scores too low, their own score goes down. How is this any different from the untouchable cast? How is this any different from creating a group of slaves in society? Just slaves to ideology and algorithms, not people. We cannot allow that future to exist, and we are ever so close to it. So the decisions we make in our industry will either prevent that or enable that, slow that down, resist that, or embrace that, demanding that every single transaction has KYC and AML is an example of moving towards such a world. Because who controls that? Who decides that? Who are the legitimate agencies? What political lobbies do they have? You're going to solve decentralization by centralizing it around a handful of federated actors? You can't. And there's numerous other examples. The whole reason the internet works and has worked for so well and so long is because it's been free and open. And every time it's been broken is because people have tried to close it off, to restrict it, to build firewalls around it. Effectively, our industry, in a nutshell, is neutral. This technology is insanely powerful. That's why the prices are so high. It's like the definition of obscenity. You know it when you see it. The reason why we've gone from nothing to something so big in 12 years $2 trillion. I understand it's 50 basis points, but blink your eyes and it'll be 5%. Blink your eyes again, it'll be 20%, 30%. It's eating the world and the youth. The reason why it's so significant is people do get it. Deep in their hearts, in their guts, something big is happening. Change is coming. We don't know who the winners and losers are going to be, but we know there will be winners and losers. And whatever this change is going to be, it's going to change everything. Businesses are just going to operate differently. Governments are just going to operate differently. And as these things take hold, they don't go back. 
I joined the cryptocurrency space when it was so small that I couldn't even find another person to join my meetup group down in Denver. There's two people who registered, me and another guy who didn't show up, so I had a coffee with myself. <laughs> and now it's at a position where when I went to Mongolia, I was out in the Gobi Desert riding camels, and the herder who lived in a gear, no running water, no internet, no electricity, none of these things, had Bitcoin. <laughs> Think about this. 12 years, that's where we went. That's how big it's gotten. And at this rate of growth, it's going to eat everything, and the youth get it. If you look at anyone under the age of 25, statistically, they're significantly more likely to own a cryptocurrency than a stock or a bond. And they'll one day be in charge. And these principles they keep for life, they say, I should be able to vote online. I should be able to check everything myself. There should be sound money. Why not? Why the hell does the government have to be in control? They're just going to screw it up. Someone else should be. Some algorithm should keep all these things safe and secure. I should be able to sell anything I want anytime. You know, if I want to monetize my music, who the hell is here to stop me? They don't like restrictions and walls. So, it's inevitable. And each and every one of you, in your own way, are going to be connected to this, either as consumers or producers. One day, you're going to wake up and use the technologies our industries build, just like you use your cell phone. And you probably won't even know it. Or, some of you may choose to embrace and jump into the industry. And then you struggle with these hard questions. And there's winners and losers and egos and personalities. There's always been throughout the decades. But to the government officials listening, because I know we're live streaming to them, this industry isn't going anywhere. You can't regulate this industry out of existence. But if you work with this industry, this can be a renaissance and a restoration of all the ill will and bad faith that's occurred over the last century for our institutions, and a way for us to fix them, bring them back together, and achieve what we put on paper 200 plus years ago, the desire for a more harmonious union. I very firmly in my heart believe that the industry, the policymakers, from talking to Senator Lummis and many others, deep down inside get this too. And the goal we have through education, speeches, working with one another, is just simply to get people comfortable with this change, the inevitability of it, and to embrace a better future and to tackle the hardest problems mankind has ever faced. And as always, problems that are self-inflicted. <laughs> and those are the best to solve. So thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. And if we have time, I'd be happy to take a few questions. Get your money's worth. <laughs> and thanks to the GPA for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Hey, Charles, I'm going to ask you a huge favor. Um, can you stick around for a little bit when you're done? Sure. All right. Um, right out by the Cardano uh, table, right, if, if it's okay with you, and I'm not putting you on the spot or anything in front of all these people, but um, would you mind hanging out, and if you guys would like to talk, meet him, have any comments, questions, we would love for you to stay and, and meet some of these folks. But uh, can we do any questions? In the oh, room? absolutely. Yeah. Okay. You can take as many questions as you want, but then when you're done, uh, they can meet you out there. Okay, okay, fair enough. I came in town for this, so got nowhere else to be. All right, anybody? Can we get a mic there? Yep. Oh, well, him first, then him. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, by the way, great speech. I was sitting over here taking notes going, if I can remember half of that, that's amazing. Oh, uh, it's okay. I won't either. Yeah, uh, Mark Luther with uh, Asking Global uh, Consulting Firm. So regarding, you know, Agenda 2030, UN, you know, SDGs, uh, what is, you know, how do you kind of see that playing out over the next nine years leading up to 2030 and how blockchain can really help drive some, some of the sustainability goals uh, around the world? Yeah, you know, we think a lot about the SDGs because it comes up a lot in the meetings we have, especially in Africa. I mean, the fourth industrial revolution, uh, blockchain is a component, but it's not the only component. You also have artificial intelligence, IoT, and other such things like emerging business models. The value of blockchain in transforming businesses and society is really stemming around, well, what is it? It's not a database. It's a ledger that allows you to put stuff in it that's immutable, time-stamped, and auditable. Okay, so it doesn't replace Oracle or, you know, uh, MySQL or these things. It's complementary in that it's a checker of things. So what you do is you say, okay, which things in the SDG do you care about uh, that need to be checked and verified. 
And that could be, okay, what process do you have, for example, for clean drinking water? Uh, what process do you have to ensure rule of law, real-time continuous auditing of uh, foreign aid or accounts or these things? And you say, okay, well, is there a way that we can put that in a place, a blockchain, so that it can be checked? How do you build a business logic for that? And it's actually quite relevant for globalization, which is the single hardest component for developing nations. So when you look at things like, for example, when Starbucks says, we're only going to buy environmentally sustainable fair trade coffee. That's extremely hard on the subsistence farmer who's a smallholder farmer in Ethiopia who lives on a hectare and his whole model is the same model his dad and his grandfather and everyone else has done where they take the beans they put on the back of a donkey and they ride it to the washing station. How in bloody hell does he prove he's paying a fair wage and all these other things? It's, it's just such a Western way of looking at this and say, oh, look, we're doing all this good. Now, actually, you're hurting a lot of people when you do that. So you need to upgrade the system and you need to build some sort of supply chain, but then you actually need digital identity under that supply chain. Then you actually need some sort of wallet infrastructure underneath that supply chain. But actually, you need connectivity. Oh, by the way, only 4% of people in that area have connectivity. Oh, okay. You see, so what's great about when you start the solutioning with blockchain is you actually take a step back. So for example, we funded and worked with a um, uh, connectivity startup called World Mobile. We did some seed money. Now they've done a $40 million round and they're inventing a new way of doing 5G in Zanzibar. And they're trying to figure out how do we create like a micro ISP model where you can provide internet to your neighbor and have different incentives for this. Because if we can get that right, like M-Pesa, it can take off throughout Africa. And then what that'll enable is connections. Once you have connectivity, then you can actually have a real conversation about digital identity, digital money, digital wallets. But then and only then can you do that. It's, it's a necessary component, not yet sufficient for it. Uh, so there are other things to think about in the sustainable development goals too. So for example, how do you measure the level of success and who measures that? You know, and that's always been a big bugbear in the international community of audit oversight and credibility, and especially in an age where we don't trust institutions anymore. So they, oh yeah, well, you know, that, 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 that institution measured that, I don't trust that and so forth. So then it forces you to ha start having more realistic and reasonable conversations about power sharing and oversight agreements. And again, a blockchain is perfect for that. The medical records question is just a great example to understand it. It's not about the medical records themselves living on a blockchain. It's about the access control for those things. So I travel all the time. And let's say when we go to Zanzibar next month, uh, one of those 5G towers falls on me. It's like, oh well, you know, we, we'll sue World Mobile later. But I'm all crushed and messed up and I'm unconscious and they take me to the hospital and the local doctor there is like, well, let's call the guys in Colorado and get his medical records to figure out how to treat him. And so they call up and they're like, hey, hey, this is the doctor in Zanzibar. I need all of Charles Hoskinson's medical records. Can you send him my way? Oh, no, he can't talk to you. He's unconscious. I'm sorry, I don't have his social security number. Yeah, I, I can't. But he, he really, really needs you know, help. I mean, how does that work? And it's such a simple and easy to understand problem, but it's the exact same type of problem to many other of these problems of people need to trust each other for our benefit, whether it's in the telecommunication space or the healthcare space, all, from the individual level to the corporate level for roaming agreements, all the way up to the government oversight. So when you talk about SGG, you also have to talk about audit and oversight, and then the who watches the watchers component. And every single one of these things, a ledger is helpful. It's not the end-all be-all, but it's that foundational thing that you can put trust, identity, auditability in, and you can't change it after it's inside the system. That's what makes people trust the thing. They say, okay, well, if it's there, I know nobody's messed with it and tampered with it. It's safe. Next question. Charles, thank you. Uh, my name's Joe Bignano. I'm co-founder of a startup uh, focused on uh, helping uh, individuals that have lost their private key use smart contracts to uh, actually liquidate and, and crack into that value. Uh, thanks for this uh, presentation. I think if I, I can't speak for everyone, but it's got my adrenaline going. This is the kind of stuff that I think we all want to hear. Uh, I, I can feel the energy or I perceive the energy. Right. So thank you very much for the statements that you've made. It's, it's really encouraging to a lot of us. Um, my question is, um, you know, we always talk about sort of resistance to blockchain and, and cryptocurrencies because of lack of knowledge. Um, in addition to that, what are your thoughts around resistance in terms of a perceived lack of um, uh, or a perceived uh, loss of power and influence and wealth that may be associated with that? Because I think a lot of us see 
blockchain is a great equalizer. That equalization means that maybe I'll have less power, maybe I'll have less wealth. Is that a factor and is that something that someone should be, these maybe power brokers or whatever, right. should be concerned about and is that part of the resistance? Thank you. You know, you're always going to have, you know, like you invent the car and then people say, oh, but what will happen to the horse trainers? You know, you invent the refrigerator and they say, what happens to the ice delivery guy? Uh, you invent the internet, what happens to the newspaper? Well, I guess this building is a little worried about that. But it's a good question. It's an interesting question. We run into a lot when we do business in the developing world because a lot of the endemic corruption you see in the developing world is structural. You know, so they build institutions and ways of doing business that benefit power brokers who are sometimes multi-generational. And so you, you walk in and you say, well, God, you know, if you go and change these systems, like you're taking money out of the pocket of very dangerous people. Are you sure that's a safe thing to do or they're actually going to let you do that? Well, yes, because when you change the institution, the net creation of wealth is significantly greater. Look at when we went from communism to capitalism in Russia, then we got all these oligarchs flying around in private jets and yachts and buying the New York Nets and all these other things, right? They're making much more money and living much better under capitalism or at least some variant of it than they were under the old corrupt guard of the Soviet Union. So it's a mindset change where you say, okay, how do we apply these things in a way that allow existing interests to still survive and thrive, but do so in a way where they now have to be fair for everybody. And when they're fair, they end up creating a situation where you end up making more money than you would under the corrupt system. Don't believe me, I mean, okay, set up shop somewhere where everybody lives off a dollar a day, and set up shop where everybody lives off of $200 a day. Where do you think your convenience store is gonna have more sales? It's just that simple. And so would you rather have one monopoly in a single store in a poor economy, or would you rather compete with three, four, five, ten vendors and where everybody has a lot of spending cash? You will always make money in the competitive environment more than you would in the monopolized environment. But, you know, some people, they just don't get that, and they age out, and what usually ends up happening is the young people kill them. <laughs> it's true. Um, every violent revolution and every political revolution we've seen has come from when uh, the dictators or the people who have the entrenched interests become myopic and they, they lose, they, they adopt this let them eat cake mentality. Either it's, uh, you know, King Louis the 16th or it's the Tsar in Russia or Batista in Cuba. They basically think that the people are just going to accept being screwed and then eventually people get so angry that some small event happens and then you have an Arab Spring style event that cascades its way through. I never in my lifetime would have thought that Gaddafi was going to get killed. And in hindsight it was obvious. The same for Mubarak and all these other people that have been disposed. And I'm sure people felt the exact same way in the 1950s in Cuba and other places. So there's always those two tensions of you can educate and say, well, these new systems, if you work with them and embrace change, life gets better for everybody, including you. And if you don't work with them, at some point your people are going to understand that there are problems here and they're really going to get tired of the way that those systems work. And they'll ask you politely first. And, then they'll hold protest, and then you shoot at them in the protest, and then they start shooting back, and then you start discovering that there's more of them than you, and then all of a sudden they're in charge, not you. And that's the arc of human history. I'd like to believe in the 21st century we can get away from that. Unfortunately, the last 20 years have been pretty terrible, and hopefully we can improve things in the next 20 years, but it changes mindset. The other thing that really bothers me is when you notice people that consistently spread misinformation and for some reason the institutions seem to give them an elevated platform. Paul Krugman is a great example of that. The dude has been wrong since the fax machine. <laughs> Seriously. T take his Nobel Prize away, goddammit. I mean, honestly, if he can't understand the value of being able to push value anywhere in the world instantly to anyone with no counterparty risk, and say that that's a scam, then I have no idea how the field of economics works. Guys, we've created the most universal form of finance with the cryptocurrency space. You can do lending products, insurance products, you can do IPOs at a scale of $5,000 instead of $200 million. You can do it all in one universal system. And eventually the transaction fees will be near free because of layer two networks. And oh, and by the way, you can put inside the transaction itself metadata and contractual relationships, identity, 
terms and conditions in the predicates, automated regulation. You can get rid of the entire compliance desk of J.P. Morgan Chase with just one innovation that this space has, and there's 500 others. And that same thing runs your voting system and your property ledger. That same thing runs every aspect of an economy. And to say that this is just, just like, ah, it's an ephemeral thing, it'll die off, and so forth, yet he gets in the New York Times and so forth. So I feel your frustration, too. It, it's my frustration. It's a shared frustration. But, you know, the kings of today are the clowns of the past. So uh, they have their time and their presence, and either they're going to adapt and change and grow and learn, or we'll just remember them fondly for the things they said and did. Hey, Charles, I have a question for you. Um, yes, sir. So I've heard that you worked at Ethereum. I want to know from you, what was your personal and professional reasons to get out of Ethereum and launch your own cryptocurrency and why? You're seriously asking me that question? Yes. <laughs> seriously. Seriously. I want to hear from you. I, I've said it hundreds of times throughout the years. What's the point of the question? The point is I wanted to understand your vision or what you had in mind that you could do better. Haven't I said it throughout all the years with Cardano and all these other things? Hi, uh, Ryan Williams, Boxing Academy. Um, I'm, there's a ton of enthusiasm. You're no longer having a cup of coffee with yourself, but tens of thousands of people around the globe. My question is, we're, we're, we're constantly talking about education and we're having these conferences, but when the rubber meets the road in terms of actual skill to put this into play, what is Cardano doing in the space? Are you, are you thinking certifications in terms of e yeah. ecosystem development? What's your route? <laughs> Okay, so the first question is, what are you running on chain? What are you running off chain? I think it's bloody insane to try to build some sort of distributed virtual machine in the sky because it's a replicated system. That's the point of these systems, at least in their instantiation. Blockchains are really good proof checkers. They're not good computers. So one of the first problems with Ethereum is this whole world computer ideology. Uh, it basically assumes that you have some way of distributing computation and certain nodes are running different computing than other nodes, but yet somehow you're able to verify all of that. It's a really hard problem. And usually what ends up happening is they can't solve it, so in practice what they do is they actually just have centralized solutions for everything and they have a thin piece of software that actually runs on chain with Solidity or something like that. And those centralized services that are off chain, uh, they're basically vulnerable. You know, they're not really well audited. They have perhaps information security problems and they get hacked all the time. Okay, and then the on-chain stuff also has the same problem. So we've had a lot of conversations with people in the formal methods world like runtime verification and CERTIC and we've done a lot of our own work internally. Um, we work with Twig. Uh, Qvic is another firm. They do property-based testing. And the first question is can you build great standards? So can you write a specification for smart contracts? That's code agnostic. And then can, once you've proven that the specification is correct, show that the code that's deployed both off-chain and on-chain has some sort of certification. We, this is called formal verification. And it's, it's commonly done in the aerospace industry and other places. And there are some product lines in the Ethereum space and in our space uh, that are emerging and materializing. They're not very big. And usually people do these things because of insurance and liability protection. You seldom build fences and hire security guards for your warehouse because you think it's a good thing to do. You do it because you can't get an insurance policy on the things in the warehouse unless you demonstrate you're following some baseline of security and protection. Bruce Nyer he mentions this a lot in a lot of his literature. So analogously, when you look at the cryptocurrency space in the absence of regulation and liability, there aren't strong incentives in the space for software quality. And that's a consistent problem that we're facing. And that's why the DAO hack happens and all these other things occur. One of the reasons we built Cardano the way we built it with Plutus and extended UTXO is it just happens that that particular model is significantly easier to verify against specifications and standards. For example, resource determinism or uh, termination of a program or you know, verifying that Alice will always be paid and, and no other person will be paid, like somebody can do some sort of reentrancy attack and so forth. It's not to say you can't do this with imperative programming, but it's a lot harder in practice. So one of the things we're going to do next year, my company, is we're working with an academic partner. We haven't announced the exact one yet, to set up a, a smart contract engineering institute. And basically, we'll put a few million dollars into it. We'll syndicate some other blockchains into it. And the idea would be just getting some baseline things figured out. 
Okay, so things like standards. How do you standardize sushi swap? How do you, so DEX behavior, how do you standardize an Oracle feed? How do you standardize certain design patterns and behaviors that are commonly used again and again and again in the space? Then, what verification tools should we invest in to actually verify that software has been correctly implemented? Okay, whether it be a Solidity program or a Mickelson program or it be a Plutus script or something like that. And then the other question is, how do you get governments involved, insurance companies involved, security auditors involved, and start talking about the certification and accreditation pipeline? So everybody says, my smart contract is audited. But it gets back to the who watches the watcher. What credentials and certification capabilities does the auditor actually have outside of perhaps the brand of Kadelsky or these other people that commonly do things in our space? And also, are they ubiquitously certified? There's a world of difference between certifying a DEX and certifying ZK rollups and layer two solutions involving zero knowledge cryptography. The complexity of those things is orders of magnitude beyond what you would see in a simple liquidity pool or something like this. So you need to have layers of accreditation, layers of software certification and so forth, and ultimately it's all down to value at risk. That's the key factor. We do that in every other industry. The first thing a Fortune 500 company is always going to ask whenever you do anything is, if it blows up, who gets fired and how much money's lost and how many people die? And if the answer is the CEO gets fired, a million people die and it's a billion dollars, you better believe they'll have a whole fucking department working on it. If they say it's Bob from accounting and don't worry about it, it's like, yeah, okay, maybe we won't. You see, so it's always about value at risk at the end of the day. And it could be privacy value, it could be the integrity and brand of the system, it can be monetary value and so forth. It would be nice as an engineer for you guys to have the ability to map that to an actual verification level and say, okay, for this VAR, it's level one. For this one, it's level two. And every time you escalate, the burden of proof increases. Maybe you need multiple certified auditors. Maybe you need proof objects. Maybe you need a formal specification, a formal verification, these types of things. Maybe you can only run in, in certain environments with certain levels of security. Like for example, infrastructural risk. If you're running a $5 billion contract, but your underlying infrastructure is a million dollars of security, one of these things is not like the other. So maybe you have to run it on something like Bitcoin or Ethereum or Cardano, because there's so much value that's at risk, even though it's more expensive to run it on that underlying infrastructure. So that's what we're doing is we're gonna, we, we've built great technology, we have great academic partnerships, University of Edinburgh is where our flagship lab is, and I mean that's you know, where Phil Wadler is and all these other guys, and they've been doing formal ethics and verification for decades. But it's, if it's us, it won't get done. It needs to be the entire industry, and how you do that is you create an institute specifically for the entire industry, and then you gradually keep adding more and more. And if you're lucky, it becomes the standard for everyone. Um, hello, Charles. Uh, Felipe Puente, HSBC Mexico. I have a question. Uh, with your... I, I'm a customer, by the way, of HSBC. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Um, with your work in Africa and some of the work you've been seeing in the developing world, how do you, how do you see what, what can developing countries do to weather the storm when it comes to like the financial action task force and their gray list or like what the IMF is trying to potentially do punitively to, to El Salvador? Like how can they weather the storm so they don't get de-incentivized de to actually continue? Okay, so I have strong opinions about some of the things in El Salvador, but I won't, I won't get into that. Um, FATF is an interesting animal. So this is an example of where if you just look at a problem slightly differently, you actually have a win-win for everybody. So if I'm a user of an exchange, it's in my best interest that people can't steal my money off the exchange. And I know by using an exchange, I already have to go through KYC and AML. It's not an unreasonable thing then to say, well, while I'm going through KYC and AML, why don't we create a cryptographic artifact? Let's call it a DID, a decentralized identifier. And you register that with the exchange, and then you say, okay, if I want to withdraw my money, I have to sign the withdrawal address with my DID. Now, you're not actually exposing any more privacy or anything like that because the only person who even knows the mapping of that DID is the exchange, and you've already given your passport to the exchange. And what's happened is the exchange is now in full compliance of the travel rule because they can show that every flow of funds in and out is end-to-end -end KYC for the system, even with privacy coins. And for you, the consumer, what you've gained is an additional layer of security. Because if your account is compromised, they're not going to have the private key for your DID. That's stored locally. Okay? So they can't actually create the credential necessary to remove the money from the account. So it's like two-factor authentication, effectively. So these are the kinds of win-wins that we have to think about as an industry of 
what can we do to keep FATF and other people happy, but at the same time improve the customer experience and improve the customer security so that they can better magic keys? I really admire the work you're doing if you're saying we're trying to solve the problem of people losing their private keys. I mean, when Mark Zuckerberg created Facebook, it took him a little while to understand the notion that he needed to figure out what to do when someone dies. Why? Because he's a college student. No one dies. They're all young, right? It's like a rare thing. But when you get a little older, so you start losing friends and like, yeah, what do we do for estate planning and all these things? So they had to kind of figure that out in the technology. And Bitcoin is the same problem. Like all the guys who started working on this stuff, they're pretty young. Then Hal Finney died. Probably had thousands and thousands of Bitcoin floating around. So how does that work if they don't have access to the private keys and so forth? So the same kinds of things that could solve that could also help with laws and regulations behind estate planning, for example, or other such things. And so these are the examples of the proactive conversations that need to be had. And I think that a lot of things can be automated, and I think a lot of things can be done to make compliance officers happy. Compliance officers normally in legacy world, cash world, they don't get to do KYT. You guys do with cryptocurrencies. And there's Chanalysis, Elliptic, all these other vendors and solutions. So it turns out that the level of information you can provide in a SAR is significantly higher than the level of information that you can provide with most of the transactions you're probably seeing in Chihuahua and other places. That's a win for the regulator, for the customer, and for the system's integrity itself. And so these are the kinds of intersections I think you should look for. Next question. Hi, Charles. Good to meet you. Yeah, it's Eric Kasinga. I'm from the Congo. From so Congo. I like the fact that you will be touring Africa. Uh, you know, so I, might I, be going to, I might be going to Rwanda, by the way. I'm right inviting you to the Congo. So, Rwanda is just next door. <laughs> you, know, you know, Felix did too, but we oh, don't yeah. have time on this tour, but we will go. It's a beautiful country. Please do, yeah. <laughs> so, I work in, I'm into plastic waste upcycling, and we're trying to you know, incentivize, I mean, plastic pickers, plastic collectors, so that they benefit from uh, our activities. And I would like to know... Um, what would be your advice to young Africans um, as far as um, blockchain is concerned? Because in Africa, we're suffering from lack of infrastructures, lack of internet, the right internet. I mean, your internet is very fast here. I've never seen this. <laughs> and, <laughs> so uh, lack of funding yeah. uh, and also corrupt uh, leadership in most of the countries. So what would you be your advice to young Africans who want to implement, I mean, blockchain technology in Africa with all these issues that I just uh, mentioned above. Yeah, you know, this is a question we get a lot. And, you know, we actually do startups. We have partners like ISATIS. They're in 25 countries in Africa. And we see tons of startups in Africa. And I love investing in them because they're, statistically speaking, better investments than any investment in Silicon Valley. You know, it's a game of numbers and by volume and quality investment size and so forth, it all just works out. And also, if you look at pre-COVID, the growth of places like Ethiopia, for example, we're most familiar because that's where our flagship is. We have about 40 people in Ethiopia. Um, the GDP was growing 10 to 15% per year. If you look at the SMEs in particular, the cash reserves, the balance sheets that they had, the stability of the business models, and compare them to Iowa and compare them to other places, they actually look better. And it's just remarkable. You have this idea, oh, well, you know, how do we start from bedrock and build our way out? It turns out that there's already amazing entrepreneurship and progress that's being done. The magic superpower of our industry is that it gives people the means to create themselves. That's really what you have to do to lift people up. So you start with very foundational things like identity. Okay, and I'm super passionate about that. That's one of our largest product lines with Atala Prism. We have about 5 million users in Ethiopia. That's probably going to grow to 20 to 40 million across the continent within the next 24 months. Every time you give somebody identity, you've now given them the ability to prove to the world that they're worth something, to build a reputation, to show their credentials, their work history, their skill sets, and so forth. It's kind of like when the internet allowed for outsourcing, suddenly you had all these coders from Lagos and other places. They come online and they start making Western salaries working for American companies because they have to be just as good as a Western engineer. Equal pay for equal work. And they're competitive. You know, they actually have the skills to do these types of things. So the starting point is always identity. And then once you have that, then you could start having direct foreign investment, lower microfinance rates. And then it's a question of, OK, how do you attract the entrepreneurial class to actually create things? And the challenge there, it is a public-private partnership. The part of the burden on the private side is they got to do the job. They take the risk. They do the work. They get their asses kicked. They work 90 hours a week. They, you know, they, 
get a few divorces. It's you know, never a fun experience, right? And then the part on the government side is get the hell out of the way. Okay, so you have to create a competitive business environment, special, special economic zones. You have to create regulations that actually allow you to do your job. Now, here in the United States, we've done this for cryptocurrencies in the state of Wyoming. It's actually a correction. We're not in Hong Kong. We're in Wyoming. Input Output Global is Wyoming-based C Corporation. We reverse merged from Hong Kong back into the U.S. And 26 laws have been passed that are pro-crypto in Wyoming. It's brought Avanti Bank, the Speedy Banks, uh, Kraken, others in our industry have come. Billions of dollars of capital have flown into Wyoming as a direct consequence of these laws that have been passed. Now think of this. Wyoming is not exactly the place you think about when you say, I want to create a high-value technology startup <laughs> with a bunch of cowboys out in Cheyenne. Turns out it's a lot more fun than Austin or uh, any of these other places. Uh, so yeah, the, the public side is they have to create the right regulatory environment. And that's a combination of certainty, rule of law, predictability, uh, special economic zones, and so forth. And there are several great examples that we've seen throughout the continent of Africa where this has worked exceedingly well. Then in terms of access to capital, it's a lot easier today uh, than it was 20 years ago. But I, I freely admit it's extremely hard. You know, and I see the bias myself. I go to Silicon Valley and other places. We tell them about the work we're doing in Africa. The consensus we usually get is, well, that sounds like a good way to lose a lot of money. I was like, ah, screw you guys. But if there's any light at the end of the tunnel, if you went to somebody in 1975, 1980, and said, hey, guys, I think this China thing is going to be big, they'd think you're bloody crazy. And now it's one of the world's largest economies, right? So who's on bottom can be on top very quickly. And what you have to look at are the trends. People noticed that there was a movement from Maoism, where they were going from everything was about me, the state, to we, and an opening of the economy. Now, Xi is moving from we back to me, so it's moving the other direction. So China is now a very, much less attractive investment. But even China recognizes the value in Africa. There's over a trillion dollars of direct foreign investment from China across all of Africa. And we run into them in Zambia and Zimbabwe and other places. I, I was in Ethiopia. I, sound, uh, I drove by a town where all the signs were in Mandarin. You wouldn't think of that, but I saw it. It's like, whoa. Uh, so uh, there's definitely trends in Africa that, to me, indicate it's the next China in terms of economic growth. You have a very young population, 70% of the population in Ethiopia, for example, is at or under the age of 30. They're extremely well educated, relatively speaking, and they have access to the internet. They're digital natives. So every time they want to learn something, they learn it very quickly, and they can do things at a cost that's usually an order of magnitude lower than their Western counterparts. They work hard. So those are the kinds of factors that you say, well, the businesses of the future are probably going to be African, and those, when they get their billion customers, are going to be just as big as Microsoft and Facebook and so forth. So that's the last piece of the puzzle, is the brand part of the puzzle. And the only way to win that is for an African entrepreneur to become as rich as Bill Gates. So maybe it's you. Maybe it's somebody else. But that's how you win that fight. And then people say, yeah, that guy. Yeah, he did it. Everybody else could do it. So that gets people out of that learned hopelessness. That gets people out of that cycle and inspires people. And then the imitators come, thousands and thousands and thousands. And that's what creates an entire industry and so forth. And usually you do it on leapfrog technology. So you're probably not going to win in the steel manufacturing world. But you sure as hell could win in the blockchain world. And that's going to create a lot of the jobs of the future and so forth, and probably more valuable jobs than steel ever did. OK, that's an old business. That's a dying. You can buy steel from us. We'll sell it to you good. OK, so uh, th those are my uh, you know, abstract thoughts on the matter. Now, Congo in particular has always been a difficult situation. Uh, there's been a lot of bad stuff that's happened, especially from Europe. And it's just damn tragic. Obviously, there were some terrible wars that you, know, you and your family have lived through. And my heart really does go out to it. But you never let it dissuade you. Uh, I'll close with this. You, you know, when I went to Kigali in Rwanda, one of the things that really touched me was I visited the genocide museum that was there. And this is a horrible genocide. 100 days, a million people died. And it was so terribly efficient because everybody had a national ID card and it said Tutsi or Hutu, and they just checked the cards. If you're Tutsi, they kill you at the checkpoints. So somehow they had to figure out how to put a country back together after that terrible tragedy. And what really blew me away is when I went to the museum, the guy at the front desk was Hutu. And the person who was the janitor who was cleaning the place was Tutsi. The guy at the front desk killed 
the, the janitor's wife and kids. And they work together and eat lunch together every day. I, it was just inconceivable to me. How, how do people get together and forgive? And I asked, and they said, well, it's quite simple. If we can't forgive, no one can forgive. And that means it's going to happen again. So a whole nation state just woke up and said, OK, the past is the past. Let's move on and find a different way of doing things. No matter how personally hard it is and how much it hurts, forgiveness is the key. So there's been a lot of problems in our own nation, throughout the continent of Africa, throughout the world. Humans are terrible to each other. But that doesn't mean we have to be terrible to each other. You know, and you accomplish so much more with empathy, love, and understanding than you ever can through conflict. So stay optimistic and believe in the better angels of our nature. That's the final piece of advice I can give. All right, next question. Um, <clears throat> Raphael, Minnesota Blockchain Initiative. I know we're all here to talk about blockchain, but my question is more, if the WHO and the UN and the IMF called you tomorrow and said, okay, we love what you're doing and we see the reach that you can have to the two billion unbanked or the billion people that don't technically live anywhere because they don't have digital identity, what would you need off-chain in terms of resources from the global community to make this vision for the future that we all want to be a part of possible? Well, I don't think I need anything. What we just need is for them to kind of get out of the way. I mean, you know, this is kind of like Tesla with battery power cars. Well, the brilliance of Elon Musk wasn't that Elon Musk was brilliant. The brilliance of Elon Musk was that he's really good at following trends. Every super rich guy and gal, they tend to be good at that. Okay? They, they hire the inventors and the brilliant people, okay? and, they just, and they take the credit for them. So what did Elon recognize? He, he said, hang, hang on a second here. Everybody's got cell phones. And everybody's got like laptops and everybody's got tablets and all these other things. And what do you want with your cell phone and your tablet? You want it to charge faster, you want it to be lighter, you want the battery to last longer, and you want the battery life to be longer. So you have four four thing factors that basically mean that just by natural competitive evolution in a multi-billion dollar marketplace, that billions of dollars are going to be dumped into R&D to make better batteries. So all you got to do is just live long enough to get the battery that you need. And then one day you wake up, you have a 2,000 mile car that charges in 20 minutes or 30 minutes through some sort of mega supercharger. And it lasts 20 years. And it's not very heavy. Now, it might take 50 years to get there. But that's where the trend is going. Just like when you looked at the vacuum tube and the transistor. When they first came out, they were very equivalent. Actually, the vacuum tubes were more reliable. But if you look at the, the fact that they could be made smaller and smaller and smaller, reliability was going to go up. It was no comparison. The trend said 20, 30 years, these guys are going to get creamed. And that's where Fairchild came from. You know? And later on, Intel. Gordy Moore tells this story better than anybody else. He said, I just looked at the trends. And I was like, this is what's going to happen. And now we're billionaires, and we live in Hawaii. Life is good. Uh, so. That's what you have to do. And so when we look at the trends right now, what's happening? Connectivity is improving. The cost of connectivity is going down. So at some juncture, everybody's online. And they're online better, faster, and cheaper than even the universities were in the 1990s or military bases were in the 1990s. OK, it's just, it's just going to happen. And you don't have to pay for that, OK, because entrepreneurs are entrepreneurs. Cost of computing is going down dramatically. Edge computing is happening. Everything's a computer now. Everything's computable. Yay. OK, so you, know, you can get, for the price of 50, 100 bucks, what would be a supercomputer 20 years ago. That's not going to stop. We'll keep innovating, pushing. Moore's law is getting a little challenging because of physics. But we'll just, just cheat a little bit. We'll figure it out because <laughs> we're humans. Uh, you know, even if we can't, we'll say we did. So. Uh, if computing is super cheap and connectivity is super cheap, well, then the baseline infrastructure is there. And then you have to ask yourself, do we have platforms and systems without any government influence at all have attracted hundreds of millions to billions of users? The answer is yes. You have Facebook, and you have YouTube, and people watch cat videos. How many of you have seen a cat video in the last month? Show of hands. Be honest. <laughs> yeah, OK. Right. I know all of you did, <laughs> or at least someone you know has watched the keyboard cat. OK, so it'll spread itself. And then what incentives do people have to spread it? Well, the people who build these things are geniuses at 
incentives architecture, choice architecture, and they create highly viral, highly addictive experiences. You might have your gateway drug be Angry Birds. You might have a gateway drug be Crypto Kitties. I'm building a video game. It's called Crypto Bison. I'm tokenizing the bison on my ranch. How about that? That'll be fun and exciting. So anyway, you have all these crazy things that happen. And you know, once they're in, they're in. They have wallets. They have public-private key management. Eventually, you have an identity component. Once you have those components, what does that translate mean? It means that you can reuse that base infrastructure again and again and again. So I don't need WHO or IETF or you know, any transnational body or the ITU or somebody to come in and have some bold proclamation and a five-year plan about how they're going to solve all the world's problems. I, I get very scared of five-year plans about how to scale, solve all the world's problems. Call me skeptical. I read a lot of history books as a kid. Um, all I need is just to look at trends and ask, are they moving in the direction that the adoption of this technology is friction-free? And then ask myself, are there financial incentives to spread this technology to as many people as possible? And in both cases, the answer is yes. So all I need to do is just give it away. So every single thing we do is patent-free, royalty-free, Creative Commons license. We've written 117 papers, mostly peer-reviewed. All those papers have no patents or intellectual property behind them. Somebody's going to take something we've written, built, and done to build some amazing newfangled thing. We've already seen it in our own industry. People praise Polkadot. The engine that runs Polkadot is Ouroboros Prowse with some modifications. We invented that protocol. Silicon Valley loves Fly Client. They say, oh, that's great. Well, that's Nipa Pals. We came up with that. When you give away your work, you can't complain. You feel honored. Right? That's the point of the academic process, that somebody found some use and utility for it, and they can change the world for it. So all we need to do is just keep doing what we're doing, which is make their experiences better, figure out ways to deal with these legacy issues that are extremely complicated and difficult, automate regulation where and when it's possible, and just wait for connectivity and computing to become so ubiquitous that it's obvious for all these things to work. Then you'll have some left behinds and edge cases. You always have Amish in society, and that's okay. They make society fun and interesting, and ultimately they don't have an impact or influence over the overall arc of the human race. And my goal is the more peaceful world. Next question. Hi, Charles. Uh, I Randall love the man Pires. bun. Huh? I love the man bun. 19 years. 19 years? Yes, sir. How old are you? Uh, 37. Okay. You, you look like you're 30, so. Half Asian. There you go. Asian. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, uh, so Randall Lee Pyers, um, I actually lived in Africa for seven years. I was the internet guy from 08 to 2015 until okay. the last country went into civil war, South Sudan. Now I'm co-founder of Emirate Inc. Uh, Emirate.io, we're the number one uh, global distributor of helium, uh, IoT, and soon to be 5G uh, devices. We actually give it out for free to people and then uh, help them. I, we, we've run into you guys indirectly through DISH. You know, we just announced the uh -huh. DISH partnership, and the DISH guys were all friends of Helium. It was pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're, so we're the number one spreader of that network. Um, and considering... Uh, <laughs> the good kind, beneficial spreading. Um, That's what they all say. <laughs> <laughs> um, so considering, uh, you know, the one... Belt Road project from China to Europe, 3,000 miles of you know high-speed rail and fiber optics, and then also they're the you know uh, largest investor in Africa, 10 to 1 to the next largest in back investor, which is USA. Uh, I'm just curious to your your thoughts on uh, China's you know multiple bans and the most recent ban on crypto. <laughs> it goes back to my original comments: societies that hate freedom hate crypto. It's just that simple. Um, you cannot admit a technology that pushes power to the edges and says you should be in control of your own life, and then in the same breath say we need social credit, the great firewall, and a dictator. You just can't have that. It doesn't work. Because the minute that somebody does and says something that's outside of the orthodoxy of the government, they have to be punished. Crypto prevents them from doing that. So it's predictable, and it's actually a good indication that we're walking down the right road. I'd rather be on the side of people who want to give as many people as possible freedom and liberty than the side that want to take freedom and liberty from as many people as possible. Um, now, what impact will this have on the marketplace? Absolutely none. First, they banned it every year. It's banning season. You know, it's, it's almost like the hobbits. We're like, oh, it's time for second breakfast. It's time for second banning. <laughs> and then an afternoon banning, and then supper banning, and then lunch banning. 
I mean, they ban it every week, you know, and okay, great. You know, the Communist Party will still have hundreds of thousands of Bitcoin and their crypto assets. They just keep them abroad. There's a reason why there are so many skyscrapers in Toronto. It has a lot to do with that remittance cycle. <laughs> Um, and, you know, as for Africa and other places, uh, we do see a lot of debt diplomacy there. Uh, we do see a lot of encouragement to use the People's Bank of China's currency, and they are building a digital currency, and we only think that's going to expand. Uh, but ultimately, nation states, individuals, and companies have to make a decision. Do they want to do business with counterparties who are constrained by rule of law, morality, and the common good of society, or do they want to do business with dictators? It's a basic decision, and we as consumers should hold companies accountable. And if we can't, we should use systems that can't be evil just to make sure that we hold people accountable. So I think there's always a marketplace for crypto. Where crypto gets really interesting is actually in the CBDC space because this is the first time where you actually can construct synthetic assets that are transnational but somehow national. And what I mean by that is we created something called JED. It's an algorithmic stable coin. And we, we did a hyperloop where we wrote all the paper and did all the research, but we just gave it out to the world. And now other people are building that design. But you can collateralize JED with any asset. So you can create wrapped versions of anything you want. You can have wrapped Bitcoin and wrapped Ether, wrapped data. And then you can, on the other side of the design, peg it to anything you want, a basket of currencies, to the US dollar, to the euro, or some other instrument, going to what you're discussing, uh, which is a great innovation in monetary. So when we talk to CBDCs, it's like, hey, we want to create that. Not only can you create something like that, but then you also can start having other great conversations. like. Wouldn't it be cool to have universal basic income or at least experiment with it? Well, what if you created a system where every time a transaction happens outside of the country, let's say you're doing it for Mauritius or Madagascar or something, a transaction fee happens and that goes into a sovereign wealth fund, free transactions within the economy. So zero tax, zero effect on your people. It's kind of like a tourism tax, but for money. Interesting concept. And it fills up a sovereign wealth fund and every quarter you do a distribution to all your people. And how do you do it? Well, they have identity, they have wallets, they have all this infrastructure. So they just they get it. It's like a dividend. It just appears in their wallet like an airdrop every quarter. And so every person in the nation state now has an incentive for the money of the nation to be used outside of the nation because it's actually creating wealth for the nation, that very process and use. Right now, when dollars are floating around the rest of the world, they don't really do that. Uh, going back to that secondary market for royalties that was discussed earlier, I love them monetary policy of finance conversations. So these are the kinds of things I think are much more meaningful than, okay, well, this Belt and Road thing that China's building, what is that going to do? And China banning cryptocurrencies, what's that going to do? I does not care. I really don't. Because, it, you know, that has no influence over the broader conversation of monetary innovation, the broader conversation of how do we do monetary experiments like UBI. And China has to answer for its sins in this respect. As these experiments succeed and they build a better, safer, greater community, they have to explain to their own people why they're denied that. It reminds me of some KGB propaganda way back in the day. So they used to go around and try to terrify people. And so they take pictures of the Bronx and other places and really like the projects, really poor communities. And then they say, this is what capitalism does. Look at all the inequality in America and how bad life is. And the really astute, Soviets would look really closely and they'd say, but they have color TVs. <laughs> you can't, you just can't, you can't lie, you know, people are smart and so forth. And the truth has a way of, of working its way through. And if you can create CBDCs that can move anywhere and satellite connections, no matter what firewalls you construct, people will build alternative systems, underground newspapers will form, people will inform each other and so forth. So they can ban it. All it's doing is destroying their own legitimacy, their competitiveness, and their ability to grow as an economy, and ultimately probably will lead to the collapse of the regime if this technology is wide scale adopted and becomes a global standard. Next question. How you doing, Charles? Uh, my name is Umar Khan. I'm from Miami. Um, real quick, I just wanted to get your thoughts on the Miami coin and uh, basically what it was able to do for, for my hometown, raising $5 million. And do, yourself, do you see yourself maybe uh, participating in, in something similar with a guy like Mayor Suarez in the future? I know Francis. You know, last time I was in Miami, he was extremely gracious. And then I had a problem with one of my hotels. He actually messaged me over Twitter. He sent me a private message. I was like, wow. This is like, what city does the mayor come out to you and like help your hotel problems? This, yeah, this guy's awesome. He's probably gonna be governor of Florida one day. 
yeah, well, that's the next step. And, he has, he, and he's got some good guys behind him, like Marcello from SoftBank and then so forth. So there's, there's, some good, there's some goodness there. And I think Miami is competing with the death of California. So what's happening is the people in California, Silicon Valley, they're getting hammered. And they're just like, we're, we're done. And so they're, they're trying to decide where to move. And right now, there's two cities that are very attractive, Miami and Austin. So you know, you got Joe Rogan and you know, Elon Musk and these other guys, they're, they're going over to Austin. But there's actually a lot of people that are flowing over to Miami. And what the mayor's trying to do is say, well, hey, you know, maybe we can get a special kind of entrepreneur. There's $2 trillion of wealth in the cryptocurrency space. Well, let Austin take some of it. If I get the crypto wealth, that, that'll make Miami do real well. So it's smart. And he's got some very good people behind him. And the point of things like Miami Coin, it's less about how much money is raised or what it does. It's about a marketing exercise. We're talking about it. You brought up Miami because of that, right? So mission accomplished, man. Uh, Yeah, and so it brings a lot of people in. It creates a lot of innovation. Even if they screw it up, it's still an interesting thing. And uh, ultimately, it will put Miami on the map. So I think he's brilliant at marketing. He's got great execution capabilities, super nice guy. And uh, he's very friendly to entrepreneurs that come. Florida has no state taxes. It's a great startup environment. There's a lot of talent in Florida. There's a lot of transplants that have come down from New Jersey and New York in particular, and they're moving there. And we're actually starting to see a really nice fintech industry that's uh, forming in Miami and other places like Tampa and so forth. Uh, I'm a little biased. My mom grew up in Winter Haven. So you know we got a little bit of Florida roots there. We still have some family out in Florida. Uh, but yeah, I think it's a positive development. That said, I, I'm a cowboy. Still got my boots on and flew in from Wyoming. So if I had to pick, I'm in Wyoming. And there's no way I'm ever going to you know, go out there. Because I just love the culture, love the people. But you know, that's the, the great part about America, is we have so much diversity. And you don't actually have to make compromises. You can kind of live where you want to. And we all can get along in our own way. And there's a lot of great Florida-based cryptocurrency companies that we have relationships with, we talk to on a regular basis. And as that grows as a crypto hub, it only helps the United States and helps the cryptocurrency industry. Next question. Yes, ma'am. Hey, I'm Kathy Dashay, GBA. Uh, you mentioned something about UBI as if it was a good thing, but doesn't, isn't UBI kind of like welfare? It is and it isn't. It depends on how you do it. So UBI the wrong way is to print money and give it to people. That's just called inflation. It's like when the Romans threw bread to people at the Colosseum. That destroys society. UBI, when it's a sovereign wealth fund, says your government's pretty smart. And what they've done is they've created a, a pool of money that comes from something outside of taxing the people or printing money. They've, like the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Norway, good investments. It's $1.4 trillion, $1 trillion, huge amount. And what we're doing is we're just giving the people of the nation a dividend because they're kind of shareholders in such a fund. So uh, some people like Andrew Yang think you should go even further and just do a freedom dividend and somehow it's going to work. I, I'm not that uh, egregious in my economic understanding. I think it's probably a better idea to pull back and say if you can create an instrument that can create collective wealth through something outside of your economy, it's equivalent to direct foreign investment when you actually look at the economic models and run the numbers. So it's promising. The other thing is that you also can start talking about incentive-based currencies when you talk about UBI. So what incentive do you have right now to recycle or to do the environmentally sustainable things or to prevent the panda from going extinct? Or I guess it's the koala now because of all the uh, Australia fires. Poor, poor koalas. So what incentive do you have? Very little outside of the, you know, grace and goodwill of, of, your, of your heart. And some people, you know, Americans in particular, we're actually the biggest donor culture in the world. We have the biggest hearts of anybody in the world. But even so, it's relatively small amount of all commercial activity. The cow will never go extinct because we eat it. People make money from it, you see? So it's very plentiful. Things that have no economic value tend to be charity cases or regulatory cases. So the real power of our industry is you can start having much more nuanced conversations about the notion of money. And you can create incentive schemes. Like for example, think about the proliferation of alternative energy. Right now, it's not necessarily fully cost competitive, especially when you look at the baseload considerations of alternative energy. Because it's not just about the generative cost, you also have to store it because it's intermittent, OK, for most alternative energy, geothermal, hydroelectric, or baseload. Well, what if when you generate alternative energy, in addition to generating your kilowatts, you also generate some sort of credit, like an energy, a renewable energy credit or something? Now you have two products. 
you sum those up, if there's a marketplace for the credit, then suddenly you make more money running alternative energy than you would coal. And more people investing, building, entrepreneurs come in, they say, well, we need to make solar panels cheaper. We need to be better at this baseload thing. The cost goes down over time, and eventually, even without the credit, the market becomes more competitive. And this is what finance professors and economists and other people study, and they come up with all kinds of schemes. The problem with these schemes is they're so difficult in practice to implement, because all the different businesses and government agencies and wallet structures are fragmented. So even if you want to create a carbon credit system, it's not global, or it won't apply here, or there's an audit and oversight problem, and so forth. The UBI question is very similar to this. Because the same mechanism that you can do a distribution to everybody is the same mechanism where you can incentivize everybody, every industry, have common marketplaces for these types of things. So the mere conversation of that allows you to create numerous incentive things. The same for uh, extinction. I'm probably going to invest in that woolly mammoth company. We're in discussions with those guys. I, I want to bring the mammoth back. Come on. Everybody does. It's a cool idea, but the real value is every single year, so many species go extinct because the places they go extinct in, the governments just simply don't have the money to save them. Okay, so how do you create a system where you can incentivize people to keep animals alive? Almost like a reverse life insurance policy, where they get paid while they're there and they stop getting paid when they're not. Then suddenly poachers get shot instead of welcomed. That type of stuff, huge problem. So uh, they're all interconnected. They all run on the same rails. And the point is you can run those experiments. And what's great is you get beautiful pure data that's politically neutral. It's not corrupted by some agency or bureaucracy because it all lives out in an audible, transparent, time-stamped place. You know, it amazes me that more finance professors and economists don't recognize one of the value propositions of Bitcoin is every single transaction that's ever happened since the system's been launched in January 3rd, 2009 is known. We have no other economic system in the world where all transactions since the beginning of time are known. You only get approximations and estimations and extrapolations. It's super hard. There's a whole field of science that studies this. Johns Hopkins has a great data science department. Bloomberg had something to say about that. Good program. And they think about these types of things. How do we build a reasonable experiment? How do we get our margin error? Well, there's no margin of error with this. It's like you have the entire data set. You know, you do polls and you try to get an understanding of what people feel. What if you could poll every person instantly for a system? It's there. So they're all interconnected in that way. Um, but I'm not a fan of inflation or monetary policy. I'm not a fan of, of printing money out of thin air. I'm not a fan of a lot of monetary policy that we have. I think actually it doesn't hurt me at all. I can go talk to Goldman Sachs and these other guys and make great returns when high inflation is here. It hurts the poor people. And it's an evil, pernicious sin to the poor. It devastates them because they can't save, they can't invest, they spend their entire paycheck and their wages don't go up. And UBI doesn't solve that if you have an inflationary policy and the UBI comes from basically printing money. If you have new capital that's being ejected, it's a collective wealth increase. And it's a different story, especially if there's a constrained monetary policy. Next question. Yes, sir. What is your name? What is your purpose? My name is uh, Ryan Abitsky. Ah. I'm a technology education teacher, vice principal, and I work for a STEM company. My question pertains to um, African innovation in regards to educational reform. Are there plans in place to support the youth, uh, the current African children youth, to grow their knowledge in blockchain and what's helping to support the innovation going on throughout the country? Yeah, a lot of the agendas we see are like, you know, Transform Africa or Ethiopia 2025 or other documents. They usually cite the whole concept of a fourth industrial revolution or some idea of a collection of emerging technologies that are not here today but they'll be here tomorrow and there's an effort to try to train people to have those jobs because if you're training them for the jobs of today by the time the pipeline is over those jobs of today have transformed to the jobs of the future and you're not competitive. Uh, so we definitely do talk to a lot of education ministers. In fact, the program in Ethiopia is about uh, credential verification. Uh, it's right now K through 12. Our hope is to expand it across the entire higher education system. But there's a huge problem. You have these people who spend years of their lives getting bachelor's degrees and PhDs and all these great credentials. And then the problem is the, finish, the moment they finish, to verify those credentials for a foreign employer is exceedingly difficult. And they say, well, you know, I don't really want to spend two months trying to figure out if you have a degree or not. I'm just going to hire the other guy. It's a huge competitive disadvantage. And so if you can create a system where you can actually verify the person is a graduate 
what licenses they have, certifications they have, then you can start having a conversation about, okay, well, how do we first make more competitive educational units? In the MOOC industry in the United States, we have things like nano degrees from Udacity and these types of things. It's very easy to port those concepts and principles and bring them into the blockchain space. And there's actually been people who have done that, like MIT and so forth. So that's where we live, is really on the infrastructure and identity layer. And then you kind of let the academic institutions, the regulatory bodies, the certification bodies, and so forth, build on top of that. And then what you have is a universal credential that's portable. Okay, it's not controlled by some ministry somewhere. You can move it anywhere as the employer, employee relationship, and you can verify that uh, that's there. Then, because the credential is not controlled by a university, and because the credential is not controlled by some ossified body, you can start innovating in the credentials. You can start saying, why does it take four years to do something that maybe should only take six months? We see this a lot with developer training. You have uh, these hack reactor and these other places, and they spend six months to nine months to train a programmer as an alternative to a bachelor's degree in computer science. It's a faster pipeline, uh, and it allows you to, to retrain people in West Virginia, other places that may have been displaced because the coal mine shut down to another industry. So I think these types of ideas can be repurposed and reused, and they can be scaled down in cost because they're near free. Everything MIT does these days is on open courseware. All the Coursera classes are mostly free, if you think about it. And a lot of stuff is on YouTube. If you want to learn about Babylonian mathematics and their sexagesimal system, there's actually lectures on YouTube about this from some crazy guy who's an ultra-finitist. Fi ultra he's, he's a nice guy. Uh, and it's good math. It's actually the, a lecture that you'd probably take at Yale or Harvard in a very specialized class. It's like a, sur a survey class in grad school that you kind of have to take for a master's requirement. And you're like, ah, okay, that sounds like fun. I'll learn about Egyptian fractions and Babylonian math. Now that's free and it's online and everybody can consume it and it's there. But the problem is right now when you consume it, you can't prove to the world that you know it. What we're building as an industry is that you can. And then you and the employer are going to kind of figure out if that's useful for the job or not. And uh, people want to be free. People want to make money. People are capitalists. They're going to do what they need to do to take care of themselves. They always do. I'm a libertarian like that. Not too popular in a place like DC. OK, Hello. who else? I'm uh, Paul Dowling from L4S Corporation. Um, just a question in a similar, similar theme, which is, um, I applaud all your efforts, and certainly in terms of encouraging and giving things away, but ultimately we have to earn a return from our labor. Um, and so uh, where's that line between the giving away and the, the charging? You know, my grandfather was an OBGYN, pre-Medicare, and then he practiced after Medicare, and, and he's like really, really hated the new system. Before Medicare, his model was if they can pay, charge him. If they can't, don't. Pretty simple model. He made more money in that model than he ever made billing an insurance company or the federal government. And that's what we do. So we give away all the research, all the engineering, but we work with Fortune 250 companies like DISH and nation states and so and they can pay. And you charge for transformational services. And they can pay in the eight, nine, ten figures. Okay, they have that scale. And what you do is you come in, you build bespoke solutions. Because no matter what you do, it's not blockchain native. You have to build interoperability bridges. They mentioned uh, HIPAA compliant blockchain. If you're really serious about getting involved in medical records, there's a lot of infrastructure that one would have to build and construct, as these GPA guys know, to actually even have the, the, the mere thought that you're HIPAA compliant. And then you have to actually verify that and so forth. And there's oversight. Who pays for that? Well, the people who can. And if you have a business model where you can coexist and the things that you do, you can give away at the same time, that's for everybody. Because if other people start using that technology, they're probably going to contribute to that technology. And when they do, your products get better. And look at Android. Uh, you know, Google makes it, but yet Samsung contributes to it, as do dozens of other companies. They're competitors. They fight all the time. Even Apple and Microsoft are making contributions to Android at its base layer. And they're brutal competitors, yet they're making each other's technology better and so forth. And no one can debate the profitability of Android as a platform to Google and how, what they've done there. The other thing is that you can add middlemen of desire into the system. So no matter how good your offering is in decentralization, there are going to be cases where you need to inject people in who are service providers to make the transaction better. That's where lawyers come from and accountants come from. All these service providers come from. You bring them in to protect you. You bring them in to 
put some insurance into the system so that if something happens, you can recover from a failure state. It could be estate planning, it could be all kinds of things. You need sometimes structures that are curated. And if that happens, it's a SaaS product or it's a service product, it's a transaction fee. There's all kinds of money models that you can have. So, and uh, so far it's worked out pretty well uh, for a lot of people in the industry and it's created a multi-billion dollar industry of sustainable companies. We have over 500 employees, we're profitable. I've never had a venture capitalist. I own 100% of my own company. We're doing good. <laughs> All right, who else? Yes, ma'am. Um, I don't have a microphone, but I really admire what you're doing as a business owner. And I want to come from that perspective because I've been a business owner. And I've gotten screwed over. I've been in the music business, and I've gotten screwed over by, you know, all kinds. I can get into that, but I won't. Um, <laughs> Um, but that's what got me into real estate and, um, you know, kind of left that business because it wasn't really regulated. Right. I need your help, regulators. Um, <laughs> but it wasn't really regulated. Um, you know, people say there are these, these people that can do all these things for you and whatever, and you spend money and, and they say music hopefuls and this and that, and, and people get taken advantage of a lot. Right. Um, so needless to say, it kind of, um, you know, I was singing since I was a child and it just really crushed my dream. So I left that industry and went into real estate, which, you know, doing very successful. Um, we, my fiance and I, we both have a real estate industry that we, you know, find businesses mm -hmm. and um, stuff like that, um, properties and commercial properties. But what advice would you give to an aspiring entrepreneur that's looking to make change like you've been doing? Right. Um, that's my main question that I would like to know. Thank you. Yeah, first I emphasize with you on the music industry. That's a, a den of vipers. You know, I, I was just at my conference over in Wyoming, and we had uh, Paul Oakenfold there. And it's a weird thing. I actually was on stage with him, which was strange. Um, but we had that conversation because he's been around the music business since the 80s. Every single person who's been in the music business has the same experience and story of you. You get screwed somewhere. You, even, there's a reason why Prince was a symbol for a little while. Yeah, people get screwed. So actually one of the conversations we had was how do we transform that industry so that it's more artist centric and there are ways to monetize that were previously impossible and the terms and conditions don't change. Because oftentimes you're told one thing, it's like an army recruiter, oh yeah, everything's great, Kiss, sign on the dotted line. Oh, I'm sorry, you're, uh, you're going you're gonna to be a rifleman. Um, okay, so <laughs> it happens. <laughs> no offense to recruiters. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, what you have to do is you have to create rules and logic where what you agree to, you sign up for, what you think you own, you actually own. And that's protected by the integrity of the system itself. So, for example, NFTs, they're starting to percolate through the entire music business. We talked to Billy from ZZ Top and all these other people, and there's tons of artists that are exploring NFTs, issuing NFTs, some on Cardano, other places. But what's nice is when you create it, you can put royalty tails on them. So every single time it transfers, the money goes to you. There's no middleman there. There's no handshake, I trust you. It's no, it goes to your wallet, these types of things. The other thing is, you know, music and creative endeavors are all about flow and you're in a mood or you're not. And if you're feeling really cool, you want to do a concert, well, you can't. You have to plan those things. You have to bring people together. And then again, you have more middlemen, you know, more stuff between you and your fans, your audience, the people that you want to have a relationship with. One of the things I love about this industry is I do AMAs. Some people watch them and, you know, I just do whatever I want. Sometimes one o'clock in the morning, I'm wearing a house robe and I'm like, yeah, let's do an AMA. I'm feeling it. This is great. The people in Japan will watch. They're up. And I do an AMA and it's fun. And you know, you get a great feedback interaction. Well, what if you have microtransactions and tipping? So you just do an impromptu concert in the metaverse and people directly interact with you. There's no promoter, there's no concert venue, any of these things. And you have a million fans, two million fans. They start giving you pennies every time you do something interesting. You add that up, that's like 100 grand, 200 grand, 300 grand for a performance you do at 2.30 in the morning. You know, because you're in it, you feel it, these types of things. So these are the types of models that are coming as a consequence of our industry. And they're here to stay. And what they do is they rebalance the scales. Why? Because there's the smart cow effect. You know, so what is a smart cow? It's a DRM term that we have. 
It's not the collective intelligence of the swarm of the cows that defeats your fence. It's the one smart cow that knows how to unlatch it. The minute the cow does it, all the cows can get out. So similarly, it's not the collective intelligence of everybody who uses the system that's going to decide if the system's is secure or not. It's just one person figuring out how to break the system. The minute one person defeats DRM, you have bootleg DVDs. You get Game of Thrones on BitTorrent, these types of things. Well, that same thing applies to getting screwed in a business. The minute that somebody discovers how to protect you from getting screwed, and that's open sourced, you can take that logic and put it into your future business relationships. And you don't have to know the, the, the secret lawyer from Beverly Hills or something like that to figure that out. It's just there. It's open source. So you know what happens over time is it's like an immune system. And there's only so many ways you can screw somebody inside a system. People try. I believe me, I, I've encountered this. But eventually you get pretty good. You get a healthy immune system. You're able to protect yourself. And then future artists and entrepreneurs can learn these things. So I do a lot of startups. We have our own venture capital firm. It's, it's small. It's only about 30 million under management. Uh, but we all the time get hundreds of business plans. And we do a lot of angel investing, impact investing, and these types of things. And I ask the same basic questions. Do you have a founder's agreement? You know, do you have a full understanding of the person you're getting to bed with? Would you trust this person with your kids? You know, do you have these documents and these templates? You know, do, do you do a business model canvas? All this stuff. All that's all about is its immune system to basically protect the founders to make sure that they fully appreciate and understand the hell they're about to sign themselves up with. And I admire you, music and real estate, two incredibly difficult businesses to survive in. The fact you're still standing says you got some grit. But most people up front don't know that, that what they're signing on the dotted line for. So educating people up front and separating the entrepreneur from the entrepreneur is a huge component of it. And if they're a true entrepreneur, give them the resources that they need. And almost all of those are now online and free. Osterwalder and Pinier, the Business Metal Canvas Generation, Lean Startup from Eric Ries. There's dozens of these things, tons of free classes on YouTube and so forth. And they're well propagated. I was at a startup center in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia that ISADIS was running. I walk by and I see Steve Blank's book and the Austin Waller Pinier's book and the business model canvas is on the wall. Okay, so that's well spread and that's well propagated. And these don't make you successful, but what they do is they help you navigate and avoid failure. And if you're patient and methodical, it helps you slowly but surely work your way through getting to whatever your notion of success is. The missing piece of the ingredient, and this is something in 21st century we have to be better at, Silicon Valley is horrible at this, as are Fortune 500 companies, because of misaligned incentives. The pursuit of entrepreneurship should never be the raw acquisition of value. It should be solving problems and helping people along the way. That's the way you have to view it, and it's the point of things like benefits companies. You know, triple bottom line, these types of things. There are concepts that go beyond the corporation, the LLC, of business structures that are baked in. And if you start with a philosophy and you actually have integrity baked into the system, actually you end up being more successful. Every time in my life, in my professional career, that I've accomplished something great, it started because I gave something away first, not because I took something. In this industry, I, how did I get started? Does anybody know? Anybody want to guess? It was a class, Bitcoin or how I learned to stop worrying and love crypto. I created a free class. I gave it away. I got 70,000 students, 5,000 emails. Turned out one of them was an entrepreneur, a venture capitalist. Calls me up and says, hey, my name is Li Shai Lao. I'm from China. I'd like to give you some money to start something up. I was like, I don't know about that. <laughs> Doesn't seem legit. Weird internet guy wants to give me money. OK, what's the catch? Turned out he was real. Go figure. That's what got me started. But the only reason I had that relationship is I gave the class away for free. If I charged 99 cents, he wouldn't have signed up for it. He signed up for it because it was free and I gave it under a Creative Commons license. So the point is to give, you shall receive. That's the mentality that you have to have and you have to have baked in. And then you inspire people to work with you. There's a lot of great businesses that are exploring new business models. Like I'd encourage you to look into Valve. Uh, they're a very innovative company and they wrote their entire business model down. Most people know them through their products like Half-Life and S the Steam game platform and so forth. And they kind of figured out a completely different way of running a company. Holacracy is another model for running a company. There's dozens of different business models there. There's a lot of cooperative companies. They say, we don't even have a CEO. We make decisions from the bottom up instead of the top down. Who wouldn't want to work for a business where you own part of the business and you have equal say and fairness baked into it? It's not like collect at the top if you get successful or something like that. 
And what that does is it makes you resilient. And it makes people willing to share their wisdom and their knowledge and their abilities with you. And also, it makes people feel really shitty if they try to screw you. Because they're hurting not just you, but a whole collective of people. And there's no way they come out of that without a reputation scathed and damaged. And that's just how it should be. So, you know, hang in there. And if you don't have scars, you're not an entrepreneur. It's, it's hard. <laughs> if you don't know drinking games, you're not an entrepreneur either. <laughs> You know, they, just as a side, completely unrelated, but it's a cool story, so I'll tell it because I'm tired. Um, they had this in China, so there's this crazy drinking game where they have a circular table and a lazy Susan in the center and a glass bowl full of live scorpions. <laughs> it's a true story. And, it's, and what you do is you grab a chopstick and you grab the scorpion by the tail, it's kind of wriggling around, and it's got some pinchers, and you let the pinchers hit you here, and you roll it out, and you bite down on the live scorpion, then you take a shot. And you put the shot glass down, and you go in a circle. That's one round, and it's last man standing. These are the kinds of drinking games that define who shall be successful in business or not. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to bite down on that scorpion. I have pictures. I'll show you pictures. All right. Right. What happens in China stays in China. Sometimes it doesn't. All right, next question. Come on, I'm not going to be back in D.C. for a while. I hate this place. <laughs> I like the people, but come on, the people who run the show aren't so nice. I have a quick question. Yes, sir. There, there's a bunch of entrepreneurs in the space who are concerned because the SEC is starting to flex, and so they are getting pause in terms of, <clears throat> for a pun, the, the newly minted crypto people who have liquid capital that are willing to invest in some of these startups are taking a step back because they're concerned that there could be some comeuppance, if you will, mm -hmm. if Gensler decides to get his way. Is there any way in which some of the larger crypto organizations or blockchain organizations have said, hey, you know, we're willing to back some of you as entrepreneurs if you get into some legal red tape unbeknownst to yourself? Um, for you guys to, I don't know about reinsurance, but in terms of being willing to back some of these smaller ventures to say, hey, if, if you think you're operating in good faith and you've built a system that we can audit and verify, we'd be willing to back you if the SEC decides to send you a no, you know, send you a letter right. or, or take you to court. Reminds me of that Eminem song, you just have to remix it. The SEC won't let me be. <laughs> <laughs> Feels so empty without me. <laughs> It's true, right? Um, you know, oh, Inglorious Bastards is the other thing that comes to mind. It's like, you'll be shot for this. He's like, nah, 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 I'm just going to get chewed out. I've been chewed out before. <laughs> Come on, it's a great reference. Okay, so, so it's, a, it's an interesting question of, okay, what level of collective liability sharing is this industry prepared to have? This is a bizarre industry. So, you know, I, I just opened the Hoskinson Center for Formal Mathematics, and mathematicians, they're kind of weird people, but they're very nice and gracious, and everybody's so excited to work together, and all these different institutions are ready to go, and they're already exchanging emails, and we're talking about books that we want to write, and all this cool stuff, I'm like, yeah, that's, that's fun. You go to the cryptocurrency space, and you have Bitcoin maximalists, and Ethereum maximalists, and all these people, and it's not like, they don't just disagree with you, they're like, that dude is evil. He's a narcissistic sociopath, pathological liar, who's a criminal, and if you trust him, you'll lose all your money. And that's Tuesday. And, I, and then you add social media on top of that. Oh, God, have you been on crypto Twitter? Yeah, you know, oh, it's horrible. And then 4chan is just like, they're just sitting in the back watching shit burn. They love what they do. So it really does make collaboration, cooperation hard. When the CEO of Google and Microsoft criticize each other, they're like, my product is better than your product. Yeah, you guys don't know what you're doing. In this industry, it's like, that guy should be in jail. When you say these things and you're overly harsh and partisan, it makes collaboration, cooperation extremely difficult. The other thing is that people don't seem to think that they have an obligation to transparency, integrity, and disclosure. So you're asking, oh, well, we should protect people from the evil SEC. And, Say, so, okay, all right, well, then who should we protect and under what circumstances as an industry should we get involved? Well, are these small startups prepared to disclose founder tokens, insider trading, all of these other things, get rid of all those information asymmetries? If they're willing to do that, well, then they're starting to look like a regulated business anyway, right? 
So there's kind of this catch-22 that's in right, the culture inhibits collaboration in certain respect, and also the kinds of things you'd need to do to ensure that you're actually betting on a real thing rather than a scam starts making that thing look more and more like a regulated entity. So it's, it's an interesting question. Now, I don't think for a moment that the Securities Exchange Commission or FinCEN or the CFTC or any of these other branches of the Treasury Department wake up every day you know, like twirling these mustaches saying, oh, how can I kill this industry? Ah, yes, let's do some evil. No, I mean, they're people. And really, they would say, okay, what's going on? And when you ask them, because a lot of them are very smart people, they read House of Morgan and all these other lovely books from Ron Chernow, and they say, well, we see the same things in the cryptocurrency space that we saw during the baronial age of the 19th century with banking. We see wash trading, we see boiler rooms, we see insider trading, we see trust forming, and these are the kinds of things that led to the Knickerbocker crisis and later on to the Great Depression, the collapse of 28, uh, 29. Excuse me. So they say, well, the whole reason we exist was to make sure these things don't happen again. But the problem is they're crippled by the fact that the laws that empower their regulatory authority are not designed for the innovations of our industry. So they're, they're trying to hammer you know, something because the only thing they have is a hammer and they need a screwdriver. They need some more nuance here. Okay? They, they're trying as delicately as they can to pound, but it's a lot easier to have fine manipulation with a screwdriver, right? So they don't have that ability right now. And so you, you can see the pain in Gensler's face and the commission's face in a certain respect. Because they say, look, guys, if we do nothing, you get, hey, 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 pick an act, <laughs> right? You get all these crazy things. You get all these, you know, scams and things. And then you look at NFTs. You say, does anybody know where some of these valuations for NFTs are coming from? It's money laundering. It's really easy. You know, you, see, you create an NFT of a rock or something like it, some rando JPEG you find, and then suddenly a random person on the internet bought it for $4 million. Look, I just created $4 million. It's totally legitimate. I got paid for this NFT I created. Well, what if you're the random person on the internet buying it from yourself? And you just record it as if it was a foreign transaction. Suddenly that illegitimate money you have is now real. The perspective of that happening, just the idea of that happening, is enough to delegitimize and call for regulation in that marketplace. I see it all the time, the alluvial uh, uh, mining industry, the gold mining industry, Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, other places, people buy gold mines out there. You know why? Because they can just go and take their drug money, prostitution money, all these things, buy gold through cash transactions, take it to the mine and say it's yield. Look, we, we just got 400 troy ounces of gold out of our alluvial deposits. I guess Barrick was wrong. Yeah, there you go. It's real money. Think about it. People are clever. You know, criminals are clever. And, and regulators, this is what they have to deal with every single day, all day long. Some dude who's got a fucking PhD in screwing people, just like sitting down thinking about this. And he's got on speed dial all of his network, and they're all like, yeah, this is how you do it. This is how you, and they all talk to each other, and they create. We run into my industry with giveaway scams. God, I want to kill these people. I really do. If I can find a way to just push a button and make them all disappear, I would. Why? What do they do? They take my videos on YouTube. They hack a YouTube channel. They put my videos on with an overlay screen saying, Charles Hoskinson's giving away Ada. Send Ada and we'll give you twice as much back. And it's like, what kind of an idiot would fall for this? And I make video after video saying, I'm not giving away Ada. I'm not giving away Ada again and again and again. And you know what happens? Every day I get an email. Hey, uh, I just sent 1,500 Ada, 3,000 Ada to your giveaway. How come I didn't get any back? And it's like the Picard face palm. You're just like, oh, God, come on, people. And you just make videos, you do these things. And you know what really bothers me is on YouTube, it's trending. So if you search my name on YouTube, giveaway, right now, right now, you pull out your phone, you can see, you'll probably see a giveaway video. Go ahead and do it for me. See if we see a giveaway video. Do we have one? Okay, drum roll. How's the Wi-Fi in here? Pretty good? Okay, what's the first result when you Google my name? Charles Hoskinson giveaway. Oh, Google. Yeah, YouTube. Oh, on YouTube? Yeah, search a YouTube video. On YouTube, now it does have videos if you send us a scam. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but you look, look, look a little down inside the videos. What do you see? Oh, wow. Yeah, click it. And what do you see? Okay, this video is confusing. It says, huge warning to Ada investors, Charles Hoskinson. 
Yeah, okay, so, so if you search through, you'll find at least one or two. They take them down, right there. Yeah. Yeah, and we make videos and we, we tell everybody and every day they recreate them because they're created automatically and they're completely out of touch. The same for ransomware and all this other stuff. So I wake up every day, I say, where the hell is the FBI? And why aren't we class action lawsuiting YouTube? Because they actually make money. In some cases, these are advertised videos, sponsored videos. When people click them, YouTube monetizes it and makes money. So there's no recourse. Steve Wozniak and Ripple, the co-founder of Apple and Ripple Labs are both suing YouTube over giveaway videos. So I feel it, the industry feels it, the regulator feels it. We all have personal scars for these scams when you look into them, and they're horrible. When they impact people, you make you sick to your stomach. Because usually what ends up happening is the people who fall victim to these types of scams are people, maybe their English competency is not so good. And they're having trouble understanding what's real and what's not real because they, they speak Italian or Spanish or some other language and they think it's legitimate and real. And then when they fall for it, they lose their entire life savings or these types of things. So if you're a regulator, what's that? Yes, I've posted so many videos about this. Yes. I posted, I think, four or five videos already. In fact, it got so bad, I've been sometimes putting chirons at the bottom of my screen saying, I will never give away ADA, I'll never give away ADA. So if you're the FBI, you're the SEC, you're some regulatory body, and you sit there and you see the victims day after day after day getting hit and hurt, you get the emails, you get the complaints, you see the evidence, and you see the, the, the people who victimize people hanging around on yachts, having fun, doing cool stuff, wouldn't you want to, like, burn these bastards? You know, so that's, that's the problem here is my industry only sees it from one angle. We, we see it from the angle of these evil, mean regulators are coming after us to destroy everything. You have to have empathy. That's the, that's an, you asked about being an entrepreneur. That's another one of the most valuable things as an entrepreneur is how do you have empathy? You know, how do you understand the other person's position, where they're coming from? And so suddenly, then you can start talking around. You ask, like, how do we work together as an industry, these types of things. How do we as an industry come together and create common standards? Ethereum may hate my guts. Bitcoin may hate my guts, but they have giveaway scams, too, with Vitalik Buterin's face on it. Greg Maxwell and Adam Back at Blockstream, they are, they're impacted by this. Elon Musk even gets impacted by this. Dogecoin giveaway, send your doge here. The giveaways are pervasive throughout the whole industry. So maybe as an industry on that one thing, even though we hate each other, we can declare peace and have a little bit of a jubilee and just work together and solve that particular problem. And this problem is only going to get it solved with the public-private partnership because you need law enforcement. That money has to go somewhere that's been stolen. It has to touch an exchange somewhere. You need KYT. You need some sort of regulatory component. And they start asking questions, where did this money come from? Oh yeah, my brother gave it to me, $4 million worth, and all these transactions came from YouTube-associated videos that are giveaway scams and things like that. When you start having those dialogues, then the regulators and law enforcement, they have empathy for you, because they say, these are the good guys. They want to solve the problems. They want to work together with us and catch the bad guys. They're not scumbags. They don't hate us. They don't think we're bad people. Now, some won't, and the ones that don't reveal the other question is, who's corrupt? Because if you're willing to work, you're willing to come down and actually, in good faith, work with people, and for whatever reason the bureaucracy is working against you, it's because somebody's getting paid. Somebody's making money. You know, the Koch brothers are notorious in this town, but their dad was an interesting guy. He was one of the toughest dudes ever to come out of Texas. He came out with a patent to refine oil, and all the majors called him up, and they said, hey, we want to buy that patent. It's not optional. You've got to do it. And he said, I'm from Texas. Go yourself. And, uh, and anyway, they said, all right, we'll sue you. He said, under what grounds? He said, we don't care. We'll just make you broke. And he got sued all over the place. And it turned out the only place he lost, the judge had been bribed. But it bankrupted him. He was a tough guy. So you know what he did? He went to the Soviet Union, built refineries for Stalin. He made a lot of money doing it. Came back to the United States and reopened Coke Industries. And now it's Coke, right? That dude was tough if you can you know, survive the oil companies in Stalin. So sometimes the system works against you, and it's not fair, but you know, if you're persistent and you keep pushing through, you can solve that problem. And we will see adverse bad regulation. The internet itself had bad regulation. 1992 NSF AUP. 
the National Science Foundation acceptable use policy of the uh, internet. They said you can't commercialize it, you can't do e-commerce. And why did they say you can't do e-commerce? They said because if we allow e-commerce, the internet will become a cesspool of spam and pornography. And it did! <laughs> but we have Amazon, and you can get it in 24 hours, right? So for everything you give, was it? Same day. Yeah. Same day. You can get your spam and pornography same day, it's true, <laughs> from Amazon <laughs> or one of its affiliates. That's the Philip Morris thing, the Kraft Mac and Cheese and the cigarette company, Marlboro. <laughs> Just the right hand, don't pay attention to the left hand. <laughs> so anyway, it's a very nuanced, complicated problem. And I think it's not a solution to say we as an industry are going to band together and just protect the small guys. It's, it's more nuanced. It's more you pick specific things that are reoccurring agency problems, from information asymmetries to retail investors being defrauded to just outright scams. OneCoin was a great example of this. I know a lot of people that run exchanges, especially abroad. I go to dinner parties with them. I look them straight in the face and say, why the f oh, no, not OneCoin, BitConnect, excuse me. And I said, why the fuck did you list BitConnect? You, we all know it's a Ponzi. So, yeah, but we're making a lot of money on the trading fees. You're legitimizing the victimization of people. That's when regulators get involved, and rightfully so. They're people, too. All right, next question. Yes, sir, in the back. And are giving you know cost you or damage reputations, so you know this is Washington D.C. You know the standard approach industries take is to get band together and lobby, yeah, and you know meet with regulators, meet with legislators, and say, look here, you know we may hate each other for all these reasons, but here are ten things we all agree on, and you know for a fraction of the money it would cost to defend a bunch of um, little guys getting investigated by the SEC, you can, uh, you can go a long way. I mean, look, there's you know, the great American tradition. You know, if you're an industry, you, you know, buy up enough senators and enough congressmen and uh, enough regulators. I mean, look, they all want to go work for you after, uh, after they <laughs> retire. Uh, you can tell I'm a lawyer who's lived in Washington, D.C. too long. But, uh, so so you it's know. like Fonz was jumped the shark. It's like when Bitcoin Goldman Sachs. Yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, that seems to me that you guys need to be more active and be more proactive in going out there and saying, hey, you know, instead of using a hammer, use a screwdriver. And by the way, there are people in this room, not me, but others who actually do that work. Yeah, so let me tell you my own experiences with lobbying. Uh, it's deeply frustrating. So the infrastructure bill comes out. And everybody, after a little while, knows that they fucked up. And they say, oh, man, we got to fix that. And so and it was just a debate of how to fix it. So Rob Portman and Lummis and Toomey and these other people, they come together, they start their conversations. And eventually, after an enormous lobbying effort of the industry, there was a bipartisan consensus agreement that had three-fourths of the senators supporting it. Getting three-fourths of the senators in the United States to agree on anything is a really big challenge. My God, it's got to be like, should we give the Senate more money? Uh, I guess we'll get like two thirds, maybe. I mean, it's like it's crazy to, to get that kind of agreement. But they, even the authors of the original language realized that they got it wrong and we need to fix it. Normal politics, you just fix the damn thing. But you know what happened? We got shelbied. We required unanimous consent, 100 senators, unanimous consent to be able to change the language. And some guy who's just about to retire from Alabama comes on up and says, unless you give $50 billion to the military, I object. And of course, Bernie Sanders shows up and he's like, oh, hell no. And that, that got killed. Lobbying solved the initial problem, which was the language was bad, let's fix it, and the political system was working. But now we're in a weirdo situation right now where the federal government is just not working well. It's on life support. And so we actually have four branches of government in the United States. Okay, we have the legislative, the executive, the judicial, that's what the Constitution gave us. But life hard, world hard, business hard, so we created the bureaucracy. And we have all these different agencies and government bodies, and they're not accountable to anybody. Okay, we, 
back to back had two revolutionary presidents in a certain respect. We had Barack Obama come in, and he's like the outsider of outsiders. He had a supermajority in the Senate and the Congress. How many people from Wall Street went to jail? He had a mandate to do it, too. The bureaucracy stops that. Then they made in a laboratory. Now, hang on. And who control? Yeah, it's an incestuous corporatist uh, relationship. And, uh, and let, let me finish. So, so, so then you have Trump coming. You couldn't have made a dude in a lab who's more outside of the system. <laughs> okay, he's a reality TV star. He's just, I'm just gonna run for president, and he did. He won. And everyone's like, is this a joke? The day after, I know a lot of ambassadors. They were calling the State Department, saying, like, what do we do now? Like, what, what does this mean for America? And he comes and he starts looking a lot like a traditional Republican president after a little while. Why? Because the bureaucracy moderates that whole thing. And you correctly identify that the masters of the bureaucracy live outside of the bureaucracy. We can debate on who those masters are, but they exist. And, oh, no, I can't. I want to get rid of all of it. You don't trade a king for a king. You get rid of kings. That's the American way. You know, there's, if you go to London, you know, Rod, Rod here came in from London and uh, he, he does a lot of great work with us. He just actually came in from Bermuda, but he lives in the UK. There's all these beautiful museums and inside of they have the correspondence between King George and all the lords. And this was right at the close of the Revolutionary War. And they were kind of having a debate over what was going to happen with George Washington. So the common notion in the English aristocracy was he was going to become king of America. Okay, it was just a question of how is he going to address it and what, what you know, horse and pony show is he going to do and so forth. And they said, well, the, you know, the French are obviously going to recognize him, but at what point do we recognize him? And then they said, well, he has no kids that are his own, so obviously he's going to have to take a new wife, so maybe we play marriage politics. And they're really just discussing this whole thing. And then he's like, I resigned my commission. And he just goes back to become a farmer. And it's a big ceremony. And all the, the English were like, what the fuck just happened? <laughs> It's like, nah, it's, it, and then when he becomes president, they're like, ah, ah that's, that was it. That's, oh, he's now king. Okay, he's, he's king for life. And then he, like, leaves. And again, they're like, what the hell just happened? Like, this is not normal. Oh, God, this is scary. French Revolution. Um, and so that's what we do in America. We were founded on a principle of you don't create power structures that are equal to the power structures you're trying to replace. You decentralize them. You give power back to the people. The bureaucracy was created out of necessity because we're a global society. We have to deal with pandemics and wars and nuclear weapons and scientific research and all of these things. You need literally for the scale of America, tens of millions of people working together to maintain America. And they don't really care who's president. They have a job to do, whether it's Trump or Obama or Biden, they just go to work. They're civil servants. And they keep thinking to themselves, what's in it for me when I retire? And there's some golden light on the other side. And it turns out because of that influence, sometimes policy gets pushed in a certain way to protect certain actors. So what you do is you get all of those things on a blockchain. You get all the flows of money on a blockchain. You get identity and all these things. You have real-time continuous auditing. There's all kinds of things you can do to change the bureaucracy. You also can break up the bureaucracy. Once it's more efficient, it can run state and local. It's a hell of a lot harder to bribe a million people than it is to bribe 10 people or 100 people, right? Especially if you have no notion of a secretary of or a chairman of. It's a bottom-up thing and it's connected with a decentralized system. It's less corrupt by design. Country of Georgia is a great example of that. So if you're in an Eastern European country and you've pissed off a powerful person. The job they give you is clean up police corruption, <laughs> especially right at the fall of the Soviet Union. Okay, that was like the worst job in the entire world. So what do they do? They gave it to a guy named Mindia. He was the finance minister. And he's like, all right, well, I've uh, been good knowing everybody. So what he did is he trained an entirely parallel police force secretly. And he fired the entire police force and replaced it with an entirely new police force. But he had two of them. So he had one police for the policing stuff, and he banned the carrying of cash, and they had another police force to arrest any police officer they found with cash. Pretty simple. It's a systemic change. And over a very short period of time, the corruption started evaporating in the police force. Okay, well, 
if you think this way, you say, well, what other problems do we have? Well, corrupt cops make corrupt cops because, you know, if you're not corrupt and you see other people doing corrupt things, you're like, ah, I don't trust that guy. We should, uh, you know, we should take care of that. The same for Major League Baseball with steroids. If you know all the other guys are doping, you got to dope because it's the only way you can win. You see, so a corrupt system makes corruptions. Systems that are by design not corrupt get rid of corruption. They don't tolerate it. They have an immune system to corruption. Okay, so that's what we're in the business of in the blockchain space. So I sure as hell do not want to go to K Street and hire some damn lobbyist to go talk to some politician and convince them to do something that when they pass the bill at the end of the day, they're delegating the authority to the bureaucracy anyway. Who is going to decide what the infrastructure bill means to America? Is it the Senate and the Congress? Probably not. It's the IRS. People I've never met, nameless in a bureaucracy somewhere, who say, well, what should we do? Maybe we could talk to them, maybe we can't talk to them. Who knows? How about we change that whole system so that it operates and runs differently and it has accountability by design at its core? It takes a little bit more time. We're doing it in Wyoming, law by law, and it's working quite well. And if enough states do it, if the federal government doesn't listen, we can just use Article 5 and have a constitutional convention and remind them that the government is the government of the states, not states are proxies of the federal government. You're amazing. That's, that, that's all I can say. <laughs>